everybody, can you hear me? Because I have a mic or because I don't? Can you still hear me? All right, great. Yes, I like to talk loudly. It works really well. Come on in, everybody. We're going to get started here. Thank you all for, all for everyone coming tonight. I want to ask, as I do most, uh, most events, how many people, if you're willing to raise your hand, this is your first Thai event that you've ever been to? Wow, look at that. Yes, thank you, thank you. You have stumbled on to one of the best kept secrets in San Diego for the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Thai, you may not know this. Thai is the world's largest nonprofit support society for entrepreneurs. The San Diego group is very active, and we hope you will find the value here so you'll want to get involved too. Now, Thai is all about entrepreneurship, and there's five pillars to Thai. The five, five uh, principles. You've, you've been part of one of them tonight, which is socialization, just networking. But we also support mentoring, incubation, funding, and education. So there's many things you can get involved with, and we hope you will. Um, tonight, we have a fabulous panel, which other people are going to talk about, but I want to make you aware of the future events. We do have events every month. The next one, you should have gotten one of these. If you didn't, please raise your hand. Our lovely assistants will be happy to pass you one unless they ran out. And if they did, you can have mine. Uh, October 23rd, please join us. We're going to be talking about the current status and future of autonomous vehicles. A very interesting hot topic going on. We've got a great panel put together. I think you're going to be very impressed by this event. There's other aspects about it we can't talk about just yet. I haven't talked him into raffling off the Tesla, but we are going to do something very interesting, so please join us in October. <laughs> November plan, we're going to actually start actualizing some of these entrepreneurial efforts. We're going to allow you to be a mock investor for some, for some companies. We're going to get some very leading, exciting companies to come up and pitch and we want everybody in the audience to pretend that they're asking you for money and we're going to get your input on their pitches. Now, if you really do want to write them a check, I'm sure they'd be happy to see you afterwards. <laughs> so, I'd like to introduce Sandeep Varma, the uh, president of the local Thai chapter. Sandeep's done a fabulous job of actualizing the program even beyond the many years that have been going on here with the folks um, who've led this to the organization that it is. So Sandeep, come up and thank you. Thank you, Steve. Give Steve a hand, please. Mike. Mike. I just want to get our program started by saying a few words. Uh, this program has basically been put on by three key players. Anil uh, Kripalani, Naresh Soni, and uh, Nikhil, Nikhil Jain's here, who are responsible for putting this program together. Before this program starts, I want to share one thing with you. 26 years ago, I attended a program like this. And the speakers came up and they told me that in the very near future, you're going to not call a person at their work or home. You're going to call them wherever they're at, the cell phone. And we were all like, oh, no way. <laughs> then they said, you could do interaction with your television. We said, get out of here. They said, you can zoom in and you can be actually involved in all this. You can actually call in to vote for your best person. This was over 20 years ago. And we were like, no way. It's all reality today. And more. As we're gearing up, what my understanding of 5G is, it is truly a game changer. It is just like 26 years ago when we first heard about cell phones, and this is what it is today. So I am personally looking forward to this presentation, and I want to get this program started by introducing our past president, uh, Naresh Soni, and a committee member who really helped put this whole program together. Naresh. Thank you, Sandeep. Uh, I think uh, what I want to say is this program was inspired by someone who all, we all know and we are thankful to is Marty Cooper. Marty was an inventor of software. He inspired us. He told us that you need to put together a program on 5G. And we're doing this, Marty. And I'm sure you'll ask some tough questions. And Arlene. <laughs> Naresh and Arlene. Arlene. Arlene, too. Yes. I'm sorry. 
Arlene has been also instrumental in uh, inspiring uh, us to do this program. Uh, I think as Sandeep said, 5G is going to be a game changer and I think we are all seeing different trends. Uh, global data traffic is growing and it's going to grow by 8x, 10x, whatever that is, but there are so many predictions out there. I think the key is, and I was just talking to a few folks, our speakers, that the complexity and spectrum utilization to support these data rates is also growing. But I think the good news is we'll see lots of, uh, like, uh, you know, Sandeep was saying, lots of new applications. I think uh, 4K is here today, we'll see 8K, and video streaming, virtual and augmented reality where you need low latency and very high uh, bandwidth. We'll see more and more opportunities for innovation and entrepreneurship. There are challenges which our speakers will address. Like I said, in frequency band, they go from millimeter wave to sub gigahertz and CBRS. There is uh, going to be infrastructure complexity. Device power consumption is going to be, I, I, I'm sure you know about uh, that uh, South Korea had Olympics and there was an experimental 5G network build and I think the experience was very good. So uh, with that, I want to introduce our distinguished uh, panelist. We have Durga Manali Malari, who is Senior VP at Qualcomm. He is, I think, one of the huge contributors in 5G. Uh, contributions in technology platforms and standards. BKE, BK used to be uh, CTO at uh, InterDigital. Uh, he took my job, but I'm glad he did. <laughs> and uh, he was also a uh, uh, senior VP and of uh, LG, and he has been in the wireless industry for a very long time. We have uh, Renika Balaram, and she is uh, from Facebook. We'll hear a different perspective uh, from how you connect billions and billions of people. And that's uh, Facebook's uh, vision. And we have Jerry Flynn. Jerry has done all the way from 1G to 5G. And Jerry has uh, uh, you know, evolved the whole wireless industry. He is currently with Verizon. And we have Tom. Tom is uh, with T-Mobile, and Tom is willing to take some tough questions also. With that, I would like to invite uh, DK to give an overview on 5G. Good evening. And it's, uh, they give me the 15 minute time, starting with the 10 minute and negotiated to the 15 minutes <laughs> to overview the old 5G. It will want to be a counting job. But I'll just give you the relationship between the 5G with the post-industrial revolution. And that's what I'm going to do this evening. And uh, if you look at the G, you start with the zero G, analog briefcase size of the uh, mobile radio telephone, is uh, invented by our Mari Cooper. It was an analog form. After that, it, the one G is the brick size. That's one G, right? It's the brick size analog cellular phone. 2G is the StarTech. Uh, you remember the IS-95 and uh, also GSM phone. And uh, that's a StarTech sized uh, digital cellular telephony. As the, really we can call it as a pocket phone. And then going to the 3G high speed digital cellular telephony is the CDMA 2000, most of you remember, and uh, also is the GSM, is the HSPA, HSDPA type. And then 4G LTE, sometimes we call the long time employment. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of a, a long, long term evolution. 
and uh, <laughs> it's the really IP based and the packet based uh, telecommunication uh, mobile phone. It carried the information. Finally, it started carrying the information what Shannon defined. And uh, then 5G has uh, three pillars. One is the EMBB, enhanced mobile broadband. That means that you just increased spectral efficiency up to the 15 or 20. And the MTC, machine type of the communication, is the IoT type of the device. And then ultra reliable and low latency communication. And especially ultra reliable low latency, they would want to carry the knowledge on the above the information. I will explain that. And uh, this is the, the famous triangle. Most of the, our panel members would want to start from here. And uh, I already explained enhanced mobile broadband and the machine type of the communication, ultra reliable low latency communication. What would be the implication, key challenge of the DS? as the, the speed of the current breakthrough uh, has no historical pre, uh, precedence, which is the evolving the exponentially. Everything going into the exponential form. And the distribution is the, almost the every industry in every country. This is the somewhat different. It's the 5G, it's, you know, China will gonna do a demonstrate 5G during the day Olympic. Japan will gonna demonstrate the 5G during the Olympic. Korea did already. And uh, con concurrently is the Verizon will gonna deploy it. and with the at and for 5G soon. That means that this is the really co competition who are going to deploy the first. And the breadth and depth of the, these changes help the transformation of the entire systems of production, management, and the government. Eventually, they are going to change the, how we live. And uh, this is the three characteristics at the massive machine type communication is the we are talking about a million device per square kilometers. And uh, that kind of a quantity we are talking about. And the enhanced mobile broadband, we are talking about uh, 30 bit per hertz per 30 bit per second per hertz. That is the spectral efficiency. How many bits you can transmit with the one hertz? And uh, that is the measurement of the how we developed uh, our system <coughs> effectively and efficiently. Generally, it was a 2.3 was the good number. But we are talking about the massive MIMO. It multiplied as the number of bits can transmit the profit. That is the EMBB. And the ultra reliable low latency. This low latency means that within a millisecond, we can have a response. That means that if you think about any kind of a remote surgery, you don't want to have a more than 10 milliseconds of the latency. It could be late because the, your patient <laughs> got cut by seizures without the interruption. And why do we need the 5G? And uh, here's an old presentation package come to me 
from the when I was working for the FCC. They said uh, if we using the Netflix, Netflix and what Facebook, they are transmit one gigabyte of a movie. It will cost to operator ten dollars if we using the curve the old 3G Quanetto. Ten dollars. That means the, I don't think of Facebook or Netflix paid the operator ten dollars. They might pay the sub dollar for that transmission. And that causing the some trouble. That's why we need a more efficient of the core network and also is the carrier right back hole issue. And also it has some implication for the net neutrality. I don't want to go into that mess. Uh, also, if you look at uh, GDP gross weight, uh, the, this is the Korea, and also on the list, uh, I captured the Japan and the United States. After the third industrial revolution, it started around the 1970s. Is the, our GDP is gone down. Actually, last year, 2017, uh, in Korea was a negative GDP growth. And uh, also, the United States was the negative GDP growth. GDP growth rate was negative. Right now, we are talking about the GDP growth rate of 4%. Uh, under the Trump administration. But as the, after the Industrial Revolution, GDP growth rate always going down. And think about it, why? And how can we reverse the GDP growth rate using the 5G? And indeed, Almost every developed country's GDP has been going down since the third industrial revolution. And Korea, Japan are not exceptional. And uh, there, is, there is a good news. How can we turn around this GDP growth rate to a positive, sustainable 4%? And uh, that was the goal of the every country. Still, China is the, they sustained around the six percent. They are going down, and they might follow the much deeper down. But United States has to turn around. To do that is the only one way. Is the we know around the 70, 75 percent of the overall physical industry, they haven't digitalized and they haven't changed to the digital domain. That means construction and uh, transportation is the all the infrastructure business that hasn't been digitized. That means that we have a tremendous opportunity for our operator community, our technology community, to support the, the digitization, that is the 70%, 75% of the, our GDP contribution, which is the currently minus 0.96%. That means that we can, if we can reverse the debt, and the digitizing the infrastructure. That is the fundamental task we have using the 5G. And, uh, and the physical world and the information digitized world merged together 
and uh, that would be the one solution. Let me give you the, some post-industrial agricultural revolution. And, uh, we are talking about uh, 5G wireless communication. It uh, will provide a hyper-connected network, hyper-intelligence, ultra-reliable low-latency we already talked about, low-cost KPEX or PEX instead of $10 per gigabit, gigabyte of the movie transmission, hyper-mass, massive customized production. That means that if you have a factory automation and you can order the, your shoes and if you're using the Amazon Prime, you might receive the second day and uh, your own shoes instead of a size is the seven and a half or eight and uh, they might have uh, information about uh, your, your shoe size and shape and uh, hyper autonomous everything that means the autonomous driving autonomous everything and the new digital economy and the new paradigm shift in the society. And this new paradigm shift in the society is evidence of the industrial revolution. Here's a one cycle of the industrial revolution. It's always the start with the invention of the tools. We 5G is the, another invention of the wireless communication. Mari, we keep inventing the new generation. Anyhow, and uh, enterprise, based on that 5G invention, enterprise has been developed. Chipset manufacturer is the starting the new way to design the chipset, and uh, those technology is the developed and the industry develop, developed based on the, those technology and then it will change the culture. That is the cycle of the industrial revolution. And here's first generation, second generation, third generation, fourth generation in the industrial revolution. I spent a lot of time to fill it in the is the all the ingredients, but is the what happened to the invention and uh, also standard of living of the working condition. Actually, industrial revolution never ever give the people benefit of the capital growth. Of course there are many middle class that has been generated by the industrial, many industrial revolutions. But eventually, if you ask yourself is the, whether our lifestyle getting better or you are in the better society, those kind of questions we can ask. But I don't have much time. And, uh, before drawing the conclusion, I want to quote the uh, Winnie the Pooh first paragraph. I used to memorize all this. <laughs> but here is Edward Bear coming downstairs now. Bum, 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 on the back of the head, behind the Christopher Robin. It is, as far as he knows, the only way of coming downstairs. <laughs> but sometimes it feels that there really is another way. If only he could stop bumping for the moment and think of it. <laughs> That's, uh, you know that, that there's a movie around Christopher Robin, right, these days. And uh, also, I found out the post-revolution uh, regarding the, what is going to happen after the post-revolution. That's 
that's I found uh, these two pictures, two flag, and one pictures, three upside down. And uh, if you read from top to bottom, it's a little difficult to for you read. I will read it for you. Today was the absolute worst day ever. And don't try to convince me that there is something good in every day. Because when you take a closer look, the world is a pretty evil place. Even if some goodness does shine through the once in a while, satisfaction and the happiness doesn't last. And it's not true that it's all in the mind and the heart because true happiness can be obtained only if one's surrounding are good. It's not true that good exists. I'm sure you can agree that the reality created my attitude is all beyond my control and you will never in a million years hear me say that today was a good day. It's a very sad story. If you read from bottom to up, today was a good day. And you will never in a million years hear me say that it's all beyond my control. My attitude creates reality. I'm sure you can agree that it's not true that good exists. Only if one's surroundings are good, true happiness can be obtained because it's all in mind and heart. And it's not true that satisfaction and happiness doesn't last. Some goodness does shine through the once in a while, even if this world is a pretty evil place, because when you take a closer look, there is something good in every day. And don't try to convince me that today was the absolute worst day ever. This is a very hard That's why, even though we are talking about the post revolution, and uh, robotics will take it away, our world and our intelligence would be surpassed by the artificial intelligence. And, but good news for you, for everybody, 5G wireless will enable hyper-connected society and hyper-collected hyper intelligence, that's IoT, we want to provide cyber physical system, artificial intelligence, deep learning algorithm, hyper convergence is like a, we don't know whether smartphone will wanna steal with us or it will wanna be absolutely somehow. And uh, those kind of questions those panel members will wanna discuss. More than a half of jobs currently categorized would be replaced or completely disappear. Be prepared to read from the bottom to top and good luck. Thank you, BK for an excellent presentation and overview on 5G. Uh, the format of the panel is going to be each uh, panelist will come and provide their view on what 5G is, their vision for 5G, 
So I would like to invite Durga Malari, please come. something that I do over two days, I can. I must warn you, I can talk for two days flat on 5G and I'm going to compress it in seven minutes. That's the amount of time. So I will try to do that. So uh, just let's just cut to chase and I'll try to put some substance behind exactly what is it that we're talking about in 5G, where exactly are we going, and probably also have a little bit of a, a touch of humility in terms of we don't always know exactly where we're going to land up. So it's important to have a network that is what we call as forward compatible and future proof, and that is something that's baked into uh, 5G as we speak. So, uh, if I if I were to just put one slide, which uh, that famous triangle of mobile broadband, uh, ultra reliable low latency communications, and massive IoT, uh, I found it it's a little <coughs> easier to actually talk about it in this context. This is one slide which is uh, visual and kind of explains exactly all the different kinds of use cases that we can envision today. Bear in mind, our job as an industry, to a large extent, is actually building the toolkit and building all the technical elements that eventually someone else is actually going to figure out how to use that. Uh, so let me start with something that's basic, uh, mobile broadband. Uh, yes, we're going to have multi-gigabit speeds. Of course, that's, uh, that's uh, one of the things that uh, we wanted to actually talk of in the context of enhancing mobile broadband. But if there is one thing that's very different, if I were to say, between uh, 5G and 4G, it is, uh, it's both out of necessity and uh, out of uh, uh, just the fact that that's what we wanted to do. We started using some of the higher bands, the mid bands, the 3.5 gigahertz bands, the 5 gigahertz bands, 6 gigahertz, and then 28 gigahertz bands, and so on. And in these high bands, it so turns out that spatial techniques uh, lend themselves pretty well. And so once you start using a large number of these spatial techniques, uh, they, it's going to manifest itself with analog beam forming and millimeter wave and massive micro techniques and sub and 3.5 gigahertz, which allows us to use uh, multi-user MIMO techniques from day one. And what that really means is that we can reuse the spectrum over and over again between multiple users. So instead of today, when we talk of uh, 4G with MIMO, let's say four layer MIMO with 256 square, we get about a gigabit per second. The truth is that when you have a larger number of users, it ends up getting divided between the users, either in time or in frequency domains. What we are trying to do in these higher bands is to spatially separate the users and therefore everyone gets a much higher average and sellage data rates. So if there's one thing that I want you to just remember when it comes to 5G mobile broadband is, there's a lot of emphasis, at least from Qualcomm's perspective, a lot of emphasis on the utility of much higher average and sellage data rates. We are talking of average rates of 500 to 500 megabits per second to a gigabit per second, which can transform the user experience quite a bit. And the kinds of devices that we talk of today with smartphones, they'll eventually morph into connected cloud computing as we try to use that bandwidth quite a, uh, much more efficiently. So that's multi-gigabit data rates. That's the overall cell capacity. Now a byproduct of that is that in a given cell, we can have a much higher capacity, which from an operator's trans uh, standpoint, uh, it leads to uh, a lower cost per bit delivered. And you can translate that into unlimited data plans. You start actually trying to go more and more into, I don't really care about how I get the connectivity as long as, long as I have it. And it's efficient for the operators to then deploy 5G. That's one of the motivations for doing so. That's at least one of the prime motivations. So this is mobile broadband and the kinds of devices, I have one more slide on that if I get to it, but there are, uh, there are several kinds of devices that come to mind when we start thinking of these data rates. That's one piece of it. But I would like to call it as more G. It's something which is along a known trajectory. It's what we've done. At least I was around for the 2G to 3G transition and 3G to 4G transition. So it's my third G transition in that sense. And we've always talked about higher data rates, higher spectral efficiency, uh, much higher cell capacity, and so on. So it is a known trajectory. We know what we're doing. We know exactly uh, what to do in that space. The second space is that about uh, reliability and latency. It's a new paradigm. We kind of drew a line in the sand and we just said, you know what, we're going to build a system that can deliver uh, an end-to-end -end latency of less than a millisecond and a packet error rate of 10 to the power of minus 6 or <coughs> even below that. Why? Well, because we think that we should draw a line in the sand and go with it and they will come. The applications will come after that. 
There is nothing magical about 1 millisecond. It could have been 1.1 milliseconds or 2 milliseconds. I think one of the reasons we picked 1 milliseconds is it's, it's a good round number and something that we can actually strive towards. But as we look into it, we start seeing applications that are coming in. One of the things that comes up is, uh, and I've been spending a lot of time on uh, manufacturing uh, plants, just trying to understand how things work. It was a fascinating experience to hear this from uh, the manufacturing industry. The enormous amount of uh, wiring that is used today, it, it actually becomes a little bit cumbersome as you go into a more flexible manufacturing uh, kind of a, uh, a paradigm. And so, there was an uh, interest from the industry to replace the wires with, uh, go with a wireless um, service. But then, if you are trying to have, uh, if you are trying to control a high precision robot uh, with end-to-end uh, -end latency of 250 microseconds, I'm not even talking a millisecond, and with an error rate of 10 power minus 4, well, you've got to have a technology that can do that. And that's where, actually, we were very conscious of the fact that from a cellular community, if you are really trying to take this technology and use it elsewhere, we got to listen to our customers, and actually we spent a lot of time understanding their requirements. And now these are baked into 5G as we're heading into what is now called as ultra-reliable low-latency communications. A byproduct of that happens to be vehicles communicating with each other, they can share their sensor information with each other, they can share their trajectories with each other, and this needs to be done with a low latency and high reliability because it's very important to do that. So that's these come under the broad category of mission critical services. Again, emerging applications. These are not something that are there already, but emerging applications. The third one is what used to be called as massive IoT. The truth is that we already took a decisive turn in the cellular industry when we took 4G technology into IoT services. Back in 2012 time frame or so, when the first question came in as to should we take LTE into uh, you know, metering services, it was kind of dismissed in the sense that, uh, no, come on, I mean, this is a high-end technology. How can we possibly take that into metering services? Today, we have technologies like uh, machine-type communications. You should pardon everyone who's working in uh, standards forums like TGPP. We have an act for coming out with some really cool acronyms. One of them happens to be machine-type communications. It's nothing but M2M -to -M in standard speak. And narrowband IoT services, which allow for data rates in the order of kilobits per second and with uh, link budget that actually uh, can be uh, the max allowed path loss as it is called, a significant improvement in that. So now we can talk of water meters, gas meters, etc., which are controlled from a network level standpoint. Uh, cheap devices, but at the same time, uh, these are things that actually have the reliability, not reliability, but I should say the coverage that is needed uh, for um, uh, municipal and citywide uh, metering services. With massive IoT in 5G, what we are trying to do is take it to at least one or two more orders of magnitude. We are still not quite there yet with 4G when it comes to massive IoT, in the sense that uh, we can handle thousands, maybe tens of thousands of devices in a city. What we want to go towards is millions of devices. And that means all the state transitions, the messaging that occurs back and forth, there is excessive signaling overhead that we would like to cut down. That's the massive part of massive IoT. That's a part that we're going to do in uh, 5G. It's not going to be here today. I mean, these are things that are getting baked in. We expect these sorts of services to come a little bit further down the road. All right, so that was just one slide. I have like several slides after this, but I, will... <laughs> I just want to say one point on this, and that is that when you have such an expansive ambition about 5G, you've got to use all the tools in your toolkit. That means go after every single possible um, band that we can think of. Uh, it's probably one of the few air interfaces or the only one that now goes from 600 megahertz to infinity. We kind of removed the, uh, an artificial upper bound of 52.4 gigahertz. We just had placed uh, that as an upper limit. But we are using all the low bands going all the way down to 600 megahertz. You will start seeing deployments next year. Commercial deployments in 5G, 600 megahertz, uh, the mid 2 gigahertz bands, the mid 3 gigahertz, the mid 4 gigahertz, uh, and all the way to 39 gigahertz in the US. So we need to have, we need to use everything that's out there, but do it in a way that makes sense to us. As we go into these much higher bands, yes, physics works against us over there, but we just use it as an opportunity because now we can spatially reuse the spectrum over and over again, which means we have a much higher capacity. And Techniques such as uh, analog beam forming, in addition to beam tracking, and the ability to switch beams in a fast manner, that's what takes millimeter wave 
from a fixed wireless or a purely fixed point-to-point -point microwave link technology into a truly mobile technology in a cellular form. So if I'm going to hold my device, and I'm talking about mobile broadband over here, I'm going to be blocking it with my fingers, with my hand, with my body, with my head, and so on. So you've got to keep switching beams from one point to the other. That's the key part that actually makes it happen. And as a part of that expansive view of uh, what we need to do in 5G, we also need to have the perspective that the deployments are going to be changing quite a bit. We will start seeing, yes, the traditional deployments with macro cells for massive MIMO and small cells for millimeter wave, but eventually there will be other topologies, private networks, which are very crucial for uh, you know, what we talked about with industrial applications, manufacturing plants is one thing. Privacy and security is important, so it is considered as a private network. And at the same time, we will have uh, entities which directly communicate with each other without necessarily going through the network. Vehicle to vehicle communication is an example of that. So the topologies are going to be far more different. As I mentioned Bira, and that's something that's written as an underlying uh, statement over there, we do have yeah, we cannot foresee every single service over the next 10 years. So we want to have a platform that is uh, capable of future innovation. The worst thing that we can do is five years down the road, we take a look at it and say, darn it, I wish we had done something slightly different because this application would have run much better. So in that sense, that's kind of a view of how we want to uh, look at 5G. Now that was like an ambitious view of where things are. I just want to give a sense of what the action on the ground is. Uh, this is a bit of a shout out to Qualcomm as well, but if you were to pay attention to the fact that it's been a years in the making in terms of early R&D, you start off on a whiteboard, going into PowerPoints, design analysis, simulations, eventually go into standards, but at the same time start building prototypes to showcase what is possible, what's not. I remember the day when we were even debating as to how can we possibly get one millisecond latency or two millisecond latency. Actually, we do it today in the lab without breaking a sweat. I mean. We do want to focus on the air link aspect of it. There's a lot more on the network side, but that's possible. But now we are at the cusp of commercialization. Next year, in the first half of 2019, as we've stated quite extensively, we anticipate the first set of rollouts, network rollouts to our commercial rollouts with 5G. Uh, starting in the United States, but not just over here, in the US, in Korea, in Europe, uh, eventually in China, Japan, and Australia as well. All in 2019, but starting off uh, in the first half in some of these countries. So really looking forward to a lot of this and while I started off with mobile broadband and ultra reliable communications and all these other new use cases, you see that in 2019 it seems to look like a device that we are all familiar with, the, the smartphone. That is true. The initial deployments are going to be focusing on devices that we know of today. We will start talking of smartphones, tablets, always connected laptops, fixed wireless access services. These are the initial starting points. But as we go further down, uh, 5G is not a one and done technology. This is only the first phase of 5G. The subsequent phases, what is called as release 16 of 5G, standardization has already started, has a, a large number of studies that are going on that will now then take it into the next level. Those ultra reliable communications and uh, low latency communications for industrial IoT. How do we bring in an industrial Ethernet protocol into a wireless protocol? These are the kinds of things that uh, uh, we are working on from a 5G standardization standpoint. I'm going to stop here, but I think I probably exceeded the seven minutes. Yeah. Thanks, Anish. Thank you. Thank you so much, Durga. I think it was an excellent presentation. And what I liked uh, the most uh, slide was the first one which talked about unifying theme. I think that was very striking. So thank you again. Uh, next, I would like to invite our carrier friends. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, Jerry Flynn from Verizon. OK, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, almost hard to envision that there's anything left to say. I'll try. Okay, I'll start with an advertisement from our lawyers. Uh, and I'll skip into something and try to make a couple of points um, a little bit different. Um, we heard a lot about low latency. We heard a lot about some of the expectations of higher data rates that, that are coming. And I can remember, and, and actually, Marty, I go back to 
omnicells, okay? So sectorized cells, CDMA, soft handoff, LTD. As we went through each generation, there was always a debate about why do we need the high data rates? What, what's the business case going to be? Why, why do we really need to have uh, a, a smaller phone? Who's, who's going to buy these portable phones anyway? Uh, if we look back, we can laugh about it. If we try and look forward, it's not a very clear picture. Uh, there's certainly, as Dermot described, a lot of work is going into things that could be done. Uh, but there's, there's a lot of things that we're smart enough to understand uh, when it comes to latency. So we're not going to change the speed of light. We're not going to change physics. Uh, we, however, can design networks uh, that include what's called mobile edge computing or multi-access edge. And, and so the intelligent edge becomes a very important part of taking advantage of the lower latency in the radio access network and placing content closer to where its man is going to necessitate low latencies. So that's part of the picture of how we look at 5G and how we evolve our networks. We're also realizing that you can't just swap out hardware and the traditional proprietary hardware uh, that we've had in the industry in the past is quickly being replaced by operators who are looking at virtualization. So they want to buy common hardware that different software can be placed on and can be changed quickly. So you don't have to go through very long rollout periods. Uh, so that's another part of the picture. Um, we're also looking at automation. The complexity of designing networks has changed dramatically as we've had a densification of small cells. So we, so we need what used to be called the 4G self-optimizing networks. We're now talking about zero touch. Uh, because if we're looking at deploying millimeter wave technologies in very dense urban areas with the 5G architecture, um, and, and I think Dirk talked a little bit about where we are with the first phase of 5G, we're using the existing packet core network. When we complete release 16, uh, we'll have the real integrated end-to-end -end architecture where we can do network slicing to really manage the latency of different slices that we'll use in the network for what we call service-based applications, uh, service-based architecture. And uh, all of these things are a confluence of several technology activities and, and, and really commercialization of beam forming, how we do integrated access backhaul, all the improvements that are coming with new radio and 5G, all of these things are coming together. They all fit into the picture that was described by BK earlier of the fourth industrial revolution. And so it really is going to be a very different generation of wireless technology. And the opportunities that we're going to have are going to be very different. So there's a number of verticals involved in 5G that we didn't previously have. There's a number of use cases. I'm not going to try and explain that any one of these potential use cases is the silver bullet that's going to make everybody very successful. Uh, but, but as was described, this involves a lot of different elements of, of our society. So, so in Verizon, we, we have something we call humanability. But if you think about it, the ways we communicate, the connectivity that we will have in 5G, the opportunity to change for social good, uh, the, the way we can really uh, address a digital divide, really change how our society works. And that's, that's why there's a lot of background interest in a 5G race between different countries because the opportunities for this industrial revolution are really very significant, not only economically, but also socially for, for each country. So what we're doing in Verizon 
uh, we, we focus in three areas here to deliver the potential of 5G. The first is we, we've been busy over the last few years acquiring spectrum uh, because that's, that's really the, the, the blood system that you need uh, for, for wireless. And a lot of folks thought we were kind of crazy going after millimeter wave spectrum, uh, but that's changing uh, more recently. Uh, and, and the feasibility of using millimeter wave is something we started uh, about three years ago in, in the technology forum when we brought our major suppliers together uh, to try and advance the availability of the technologies that we're working on in their labs and to try and commercialize this. So we conducted a number of trials over uh, 11 different market areas to understand the the behavior or the opportunities uh, with millimeter wave technology. And then we also, while we were doing this, began to, to build uh, very rich end-to-end -end fiber resources. Now, Verizon from the wireline historically was primarily in the Northeast, but we also acquired uh, several other companies. Uh, we, we made some uh, business commitments to Corning for an awful lot of fiber that we would buy over a few years, which we are doing. Uh, and all of this was to put in place the fiber because you need to connect all of these cells that are using the millimeter wave spectrum as well as our other spectrum holdings. And then we've, we've also learned as we've gone through the um, trials that we've had in millimeter wave uh, just how much we can do, how, how many of our existing small cells we can reuse or redeploy uh, spectrum as we start refarming towards uh, 5G from, from 2G and 3G and um, that all is part of an overall plan that comes together and so recently we announced that we're open for business, we're starting with uh, what we call 5G ultra wideband which is really fixed wireless to the home. Uh, we have four cities that will be commercial next week. And uh, this is all deployments that will be evolving to 3GPP standards compliance uh, in the near future. And in addition to that, we'll be adding a, a large number of cities. So I, I, I thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you. And I, I really, uh, think that 5G is, is, is going to be a, a really life changer for, for many of us. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jerry, for an excellent presentation. And also thank you for your contribution to 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G, and 5G. I think uh, we are you know, fortunate to have you. Next. I would like to invite, after Carrier, what comes next? Uncarrier, no. T-Mobile Town, please. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to speaking with all of you today. It's uh, pretty hard to follow Durga and, and Jerry. And they stole a lot of my thunder. It's actually easier for I mean, us to see up here than it is right there. to see yeah. on the slide. And, uh, excuse me while I pull this up. So I think we've hinted around at a few things, uh, but I, I really want to make a statement right off the bat. We're talking about magic here tonight. I, I want you guys to realize that. You know, 5G is, is really the beginning of, of something really special and we're, we're at the cusp of some really earth-changing things that um, are going to really affect our everyday lives, our business, our careers. And people are going to be using 5G to uh, do technologies and provide services that haven't even thought of yet. And, and we've seen that happen over and over again through these revolutions we keep hearing about, right? the 2G, 3G, 4G. 5G is going to take it even farther than that. So. Um, I, again, uh, a lot of my thunder was taken I, I, I think, well, sorry, I'm a wanderer and we're, we're using a fixed microphone. You can pick up a mic. So, so the, 
Yeah, that'd be good. Thank you. Hello. Awesome. Thank you so much. So, all these things um, have been mentioned already, and I, I don't want to get too much into the underlying technology around this, but the, the promise that we've heard of for years of all the, the devices that we interact with, our refrigerators, everything connected into a wireless uh, network of some sort that collects our data and, and allows us to interact with all of our, our aspects of our life is really coming true with 5G for, for a lot of different reasons. Um, the sensor area networks we talked about before are, are, are interesting. Uh, the, the way of life that, that's going to change around this is, is very interesting. We're already having serious discussions with people around 5G that's, that's going to affect our lives. Um, so we're talking to major cities about the fact that you're going to go into major metropolitan areas in the U.S. and they're going to be completely autonomous. You're not going to be able to drive your car potentially somewhere like Manhattan down the road. There's going to be autonomous driving cars everywhere. There won't be traffic signals anymore except to, to manage the pedestrian traffic that's out there. Uh, there's sensors already being put into toothbrushes. So you can make sure your kids are actually brushing your teeth when they sit down. And not only that, but we can pay attention to are they getting to the back molars? And based on your hygiene, we can drop your insurance rates if you do a good job with your with your tooth brushing, we can drop your dental insurance rates because we know you're good at taking care of your teeth and you have good dental hygiene. So those are the types of things that are going to happen out of this. So I'm not going to go through all this. Jerry did a great job on the technology. Jerry talked a bit about the applications, but exciting stuff uh, coming down the road, and it's happening now. We, we are 5G is 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 there. It's it's happening as we speak. T-Mobile has a very different perspective, though. Uh, on how we want to deploy 5G in, into the into the wild. So uh, we, we try to be innovators. We're, we're definitely always trying to push the envelope, adding new technologies. Uh, LT Advanced, we really jumped into. We were, you know, our CTO came out and said we were going to be the first to gigabit in LTE, and we were. We did an Alpharetta to Georgia. Uh, we finally have devices, thanks to Qualcomm, Snapdragon 845, can do gigabit now on LTE, and. We, we looked at 5G and we said, millimeter is amazing, absolutely. We have to be in millimeter wave. The speeds are there, uh, the density is there. I mean, we, we, we heard about how it's spectral efficient, but there's also a lot of bandwidth available there. And bandwidth in the air is the key to speed, right? That's, that's, the, that's the message that, that's there. Because once we, once we hit the core, that's where the magic happens, there's fiber. We have lots of speed, we have lots of low latency, we can deliver lots of services, but the air is, is where we, we, we're going to have our, our challenges. So from our perspective, if we think about things like maybe we want to track our children and we're going to put sensors into the, you know, the seams of their pants and make sure they're going where they're going and they're safe and they're good in school or they're, they're going with their friends to the beach and we know where they are, we can't rely on just millimeter wave keep track of them because it's it's very as was mentioned earlier it's a limiting it's a limiting resource for us it, it doesn't it doesn't shoot very far it's very easy to block it, it doesn't penetrate buildings very well um, you can block a, a 5g cell tower with your hand and block the cell tower. so you're going to need to have 5g signaling the ability to connect these devices uh, ubiquitously in, in the future and, and we're going to be the first ones i think to, to do this in, in a big way and the reason we're doing this is because we want to make 5G available. We want to make it available and ubiquitous. Just like you use your, your cell phone today, we want you to be able to use your 5G device when it comes out the same way. So we're going to be deploying 5G technology across all of our spectrums. So we have, uh, thank you Verizon, we have some low band spectrum in the 700 space. Uh, we have, we, we lived and breathed in the mid-band space for a long time. We've got a bunch of millimeter wave when we acquired Metro PCS and are acquiring more. And then we just finished uh, a historic auction on 600 megahertz, which Durgo alluded to. And we're in a very large deployment of 600 nationwide. And all of our 600 capable equipment that we're putting in there is 5G capable. So when 
when we're all ready, 5G NR, you know, is out, we're going to deploy that right away, right into our 600 na na network, and we're going to have nationwide 5G right to your handset. So we're pretty excited about that. And this is our footprint today. Uh, this is a graphic, so I couldn't edit it. Uh, we're actually at 323 million square miles. We have 323 people covered in the population today. Uh, we're expected to, to reach the 325. You know, we, we hear that 325 is the population in the United States, but uh, it depends on who you ask. Uh, but we are definitely, from a coverage perspective, especially with 600, again, low band, shoots a long way, penetrates buildings well. We're finally able to get those urban spaces that have typically been an Achilles heel for T-Mobile. So we're really excited about this. And uh, 5G is definitely, we are all in. Uh, when the 3GPPP were developing the standard, ours was the only CEO that went to the labs and said, we want to be involved in this. We want to get our gear in here. We want to make sure that we're helping you guys develop the standard. And we're engaged 100%. And it's, and it's really worked well. So, uh, we, our CTO has announced that we will have 30 cities live with 5G this year, by the end of 2018. We're super excited about that. Um, it's probably going to be in our 600 space, to be frank. I'm not sure how much of that's going to be millimeter wave yet. I, I don't have access to those types of, of data, but uh, it's, it's pretty exciting them? news. San Diego one over there? Um, I'm not allowed to tell you that. <laughs> and by the way, I didn't flash through the advertisement from our lawyers because at the end of the day, who has time to read that anyhow? And I wanted to make sure that you guys understood that you know, we're trying to be very transparent today as well. And, and we're really excited about the fact that not only are we going to give you guys the ubiquitous experience, but it's going to be live this year. So obviously, we're waiting for the hardware, right? So we can't wait for that. We, We've certainly jumped into the narrowband IoT space in a very heavy way. We've launched narrowband IoT nationwide with T-Mobile, so that's part of the 5G strategy that we heard about earlier. It's part of the triangle. Um, but we still need the OEMs as far as getting handsets and other devices out in the marketplace to leverage the full 5G experience. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, we'll hear they're coming in the first part of next year, and, and we're going to be ready to go, and we're going to have cities lit ready to be used. And I think the other thing that sometimes gets missed by the general public, you guys are all smart and, and technical, and it's fantastic, but one of the other real promises of 5G that's really exciting is we saw that slide about the history of 0G, 1G, 2G, 3G. You know, those used to be cliffs we'd have to fall off, right? If you, if you weren't in 4G land, you fell off a cliff down to 3G land, and if, you know, before that, if you were in 3G land and you fell off, you'd go down to 2G land and, and the, the worlds could never coexist, right? And, the, and that's one of the great things about 5G. For the first time, we're going to be able to leverage all these 4G LTE resources that we've spent all this money on, all these technology improvements that we've done through LTE Advanced, and we're going to be able to use all that, layer 5G on top of it when it's red, when it's there, when it's available, but at the end of the day, we're going to have a great end user experience for you guys. So I, I can't wait. I think it's the most exciting thing happening in technology today. And uh, I look forward to talking a whole lot more about it today. And uh, with that, I'll hand it back. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, that was an excellent presentation. Um, I think I like your slide about uh, you know coverage and spectrum uh, usage. That was very well done. So thank you for that. Um, I think we've heard about uh, technology use cases and the story from both the carrier and uncarrier side. Uh, now I would like to invite uh, Renuka from Facebook. And we want to hear from a user's perspective what Facebook and why would Facebook be interested in 5G? Please, Renuka. are in the application space and we use all the apps on these carriers networks. So um, it's, it's about how do we make this application space and in general the connectivity to be enabled for all the people. That's, that's our mission. 
Uh, we talk about connecting people, we talk about connecting communities with our applications, and as part of that, bringing the world closer together. So that's, that's our mission. And how does that map into what 5G is about? So these applications definitely are going to be gaining a lot from having 5G connectivity. The AR, VR, or the low latency, all of that is going to kind of help bring these into the hands of more people. But at the same time, as you can see here, our long-term roadmap also talks about connectivity. So bringing connectivity to people is a big part of our um, I would say goals right now. So apart from applications, we have been, uh, and this might be new to some of you who only know the Facebook's Facebook face of it. Uh, this, is, uh, this is about connecting people and we have been working a lot in terms of uh, understanding in the different geographies how the connectivity is kind of blocked because of various regions and how the operator efforts can be you know, pulled forward with help from community itself. So the that right hand side you can see there we, we talk about different tools which can help us to get the internet in the hands of people. And those tools not only are our in-house engineering build tools but also uh, we see that this is a big challenge um, in terms of numbers you can say that 3.8 billion people are not yet connected. And so we focus on that number and we see that we have to do everything possible to bring them online. And uh, on that front, this is about a toolkit that we use in-house and also with the partners that we have. And so there are various different programs that touch from all the way from the fiber in the ground to satellite and everything in between that, that actually um, needs to be addressed to, to enable these networks to be coming online. So to that extent, our focus is going to be on what we call a community effort of taking the uh, in-house tools and then bringing the operators, the next level OEMs, system integrators, all of them together, and then building these networks in a way that is going to be slightly different than how it is done today. So to that extent, I'm introducing a program here which is called the Telecom Infra Project. That's an engineering focused program where we uh, work with the operators in the industry and it's uh, driven by all of those uh, experts who are doing it for a lot many years through 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G, but we are giving them a neutral platform to look at uh, the whole network building from a different point of view and then bringing them in a in a way that they can collaborate and solve those problems together to, to deploy networks which will be not just the 4G but also will be 5G and, and so on. So of course I'm, I'm talking about the different part of it, technologies at the base of it. We, we understand the value of 3GPP and the likes of uh, technology partners like Qualcomm and others were uh, doing all of that hard work to get the tech into um, into the standardization effort and then we will be also uh, getting those benefits with the operators and seeing how we can get across the world, we can get the technology development done in a way that we can uh, open it up in terms of uh, open software, open hardware and in some cases open lab spaces which can be used for doing innovation. And that innovation, again, will be uh, taking the 5G as, as, as a major focus. We think that it's not only about connecting those people who are not at all connected, but it's also important to improve the connectivity for people who have connectivity, but not to the extent that it, it is uh, uh, useful or beneficial for them to exchange knowledge bases. So yeah, so this effort, we're, we're talking about it, where the industry comes together. As you can see, we have uh, the community that consists of all layers of how the networks are being built today. And that includes, um, as we mentioned, that includes the operators, the ones from the 
developed areas as well as from the areas where you see challenges in terms of even laying the fiber or, or bringing in the basic uh, internet life. And then we have partners who are working with the operators today and understand how you build the technology and how you build the pieces together and how you sustain it once it is deployed. So all of them are kind of working today. We are excited to say that this is a group of more than 500 companies today and uh, it's, it's growing every year and uh, various technologies are taking shape. Uh, some are in the incubation phase but some are already in field trial outside of the lab and uh, we are looking forward to how we can get those results back to the operators and they can have those learnings applied to how they then uh, get into the next level of or the next generation of network building. And again, all of this we see that will be applicable to 5G because up to 4G we have seen that it, it's, a, it's a transition that has already kind of happened, but 5G will be a good uh, pilot program here to see how we can define, develop and uh, deploy these technologies in a different way which is going to be an open and collaborative manner. And we are, um, just to clarify, we are not being an operator here, we are going to be a very close partner of the operators who will uh, guide and uh, also learn from the operators and build on top of it to make it all happen in an accelerated manner. So yeah, so this is, this is about an um, event that we usually host on a yearly basis. It's, uh, it's coming up very soon and I would invite all of you to come see and uh, experience how this technology collaboration is coming into existence. And it's, it's happening in London this year and uh, we have a two days uh, event where we will be talking about where we are in terms of different technology um, development aspects and we will also be talking about how the operators are actually going to deploy the tech that is coming through this kind of platform. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. That was pretty impressive uh, connecting 3.8 billion people uh, at affordable cost. That is a noble goal. And I think the telecom infrastructure project that you put together with uh, 500 plus members, that's very impressive. I think in a short time, putting, bringing all these people together is a very uh, difficult task, and you guys have done that, that's all. So, uh, and I, I see from the names, everybody uh, from cable manufacturers to carriers to technology providers, everybody is in there, so that is very good. So, uh, next I think I would like to invite uh, the presenters here. And we'll start with uh, question and answers. And uh, audience, please, uh, uh, you know, uh, you can start uh, thinking about your questions, and and uh, you can ask uh, these questions to the panelists. So um, one thing that I saw uh, from all your presentation is 5G supports frequency bands in millimeter wave in sub six gigahertz and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, other bands. It's a large band support. Um, how will, is the 5G infrastructure going to support, and devices, it's going to support this, uh, these uh, brand, uh, I mean bands and uh, frequency spectrum? Durga? Yeah, get started. I mean, I'll give the perspective from the device standpoint. So first things first, uh, uh, the number of bands and band combinations that exist in 4G today is already quite a lot. We don't use the millimeter wave bands there, but we have a very large number of both FTT and DVD bands that are used. And it's not just the bands, but it's all the band combinations. So in the RF front end, and when you actually take it to the transceiver itself, there's a lot of learnings uh, that uh, have come in from 4G. So we are not starting from scratch. We're actually building upon something that we've done quite well over the years. <laughs> I'm just wondering whether there's an echo. Uh, so, there's, uh, so there's a lot that we started off with. One of the new things that we are doing now is, uh, in effect, it's all of the above, in the sense that it's uh, both FTD and TDD bands in below 6 gigahertz. And then by the time we get into the millimeter wave bands, then we have bands that go all the way from, usually they start at 24 gigahertz, 
24 to 42 gigahertz is uh, predominantly where most of the action is. And over time, we'll go much higher than up to 52 gigahertz as well. But that's not the end of that because, as uh, was pointed out earlier, for the first time, we're actually starting off uh, uh, a new G without necessarily talking in terms of a fall back to the previous G. What we're really stating is that uh, the device is simultaneously connected to both 4G and 5G systems. And therefore, you actually have now a combination of all the 4G bands that we just built, and then you add all the 5G bands on the top of it, and then you take the band combinations. The last time I checked that the number of band combinations has already exceeded 10,000. But uh, as I said, it's uh, been a long way as we've kind of come to this point in time. So a lot of lessons learned. And suffice it to say that from Qualcomm perspective, we'll be ready for the, these devices. It's a lot of complexity, but it's a lot of good opportunity and uh, for uh, us. And uh, it's quite amazing, actually, sometimes to just think about how far we've come in this space. But we believe that the industry is going to be ready. We'll be ready for sure. By the way, if you're going to have to take the, the first response, we're probably going to lose a lot of content. <laughs> but. Uh, He's, he's brought up a great point, which is what, what's happening today with MIMO, carry aggregation, uh, the, the next generations of that that come in, involved with this, this blend between 4G and 5G is we're putting a lot more intelligence out into the network to make decisions. What, what's the best spectrum? How many carriers can we bring together? How many antennas are going to be talking to each other? So it allows us, you know, with things like massive MIMO, where we're going to have lots of different we're going to have endpoints talking to lots of different access points into the network. And so the, bringing that intelligence out and is the only way that we're going to be able to deliver on the, the latency discussions we've talked about today at one millisecond and bandwidth perspective. We're going to be pulling on all of those resources and the, the intelligence built into the network as well as in the chips and the handsets are going to be able to manipulate the network and take advantage of, of the different spectrums to blend them together and provide an amazing experience for us at the end of the day. Uh, maybe if I could try to take this in a little bit different direction and, and try and explain this in terms of plumbing uh, and, and think of this as pipes for water. So sub-6 gigahertz, we're using the same channel bandwidths that, that we have in LTE, but we can do carrier combinations, and we're up to six, seven different carrier combinations. Adding on to that, the above 6 gigahertz, the millimeter wave, uh, we're talking about pipes that are, that are, that are starting uh, with bandwidth widths of 50 megahertz up to 400 megahertz, and then we, within that, we can do contiguous, not contiguous carrier combinations, which gets you uh, to a very sophisticated plumbing that goes to all the potential combinations that you can have, which become very mind-boggling, or, or so the folks that I have working in 3GPP tell me. Uh, but, but basically, we've, we've gone from rather simplistic views of, of dedicating frequency bands now combining many different frequency plans, as, as Durga explained, and, and this is only going to increase as we go forward because this is really the way we're going to be able to increase throughput. Yeah, so I'll just add to that like a lot of operators that we talk to are very excited about how that millimeter wave uh, length of bands is um, giving them all possibilities. So that's one aspect of it. The other thing we see is that they always want to upgrade the networks in the least disruptive way possible. So with that, the sub-6 and having that option and uh, adding 5G along with LTE, that looks attractive to them. And then the fixed wireless kind of use case is definitely picking up. So we, we have our own in-house tech in that space as well. We call it the telegraph, and we are we are saying that that is going to you know address the issue of where you can't get the fiber to the last mile, and that's that's again one of the use cases matches perfectly with that opened up spectrum. So yeah, that's that's a good way of putting 5G to use right away rather than keeping it in the lab. I would say. 
Good. Next question I would like to ask is, uh, ours is an entrepreneurial community here, and I would like to pose a question to the panel. What new innovations and new companies can be formed out of 5G? Uh, I'm not sure specifically which new companies can be formed, but I think if you go back uh, 10 years or more, uh, we didn't have Uber. Uh, we, we didn't use smartphones the way we use them today for near field communications, banking. Uh, we've really sort of replaced the role of the computer with a mobile device. And then we came along with IoT uh, for, for, for sensors or machine-to-machine -machine communications. And so we have different flavors of uh, IoT, whether it's narrowband IoT or CAD-M, and we're introducing, we've done voice on CAD-M, and uh, so now you have a whole new set of possibilities with video, uh, with doing identity, Companies are starting to, to use facial recognition or, or different ways of, of using wireless for identity and authentication. So companies are, are springing up around this. Uh, so, so I think really there's a very wide field for, for new companies for 5G as well as for evolution of 4G. Yeah, I was going to say that uh, I, I, it, it's hard to actually predict exactly uh, you know, how this is going to pan out, but I, we can already see some glimpses of exactly the kinds of uh, uh, brand new uh, applications that are beginning to emerge. They won't be there in 2019, but you can see them happening over time. Uh, and they, these applications end up using 5G more or less like a tool, as in it's a link that allows a much lower latency and a high reliability link, and therefore you can actually bring out new applications with that. So mobile XR, for example, is one of those things. I and mean, if you kind of try out um, uh, VR headsets today, they're good, but we can do much better than that. I mean, uh, the headsets are big, they are bulky, uh, we sometimes have to put in a smartphone inside it, and then effectively we're doing this in a very huge manner in, in some sense. But then um, there's so much more that you can do when you actually have the ability uh, to process across the uh, across different nodes in the network itself, and that's the advent of what is known as mobile edge computing. The fact that you can actually distribute the processing in a certain way, and in that sense, we are using 5G as that fabric in which information is actually being conveyed from one place to the other. Uh, the other thing that's gradually emerging, and we talk about it quite a lot, is the confluence of 5G and AI. You know, I completely understand that these are two different uh, hype cycles in some sense, and you put it together, it seems like, are you kidding me? Is it possible? <laughs> but it's actually real. There's more to it than what we think, and that is related to the fact that uh, historically, when we started, when we, in, when we talked about AI in the beginning, a lot of uh, both the training and the inference was really done in the cloud. But we are going to gradually see more intelligent devices where maybe the training is done in the cloud, but you'll see low power inference that will start coming up in devices. And this is another emerging trend. And there's a lot that can be done in the space and new applications that will come in. But uh, I remain optimistic on that. I mean, this is a place where, uh, this is my personal view that I think that uh, a lot of startups, uh, I see grad students actually coming up with some really good uh, applications of that. So I look forward to it. As I said, our job is to actually build the toolkit over here. We're not going to be forcing all the applications, but I really look forward to that. I have to agree with my fellow panelists. I, there's a couple of things that, that come to mind for me for this. This is actually the second time I've been asked this question recently. And uh, one of, you, VR was mentioned earlier, one of my favorite 5G stories is uh, they put 5G, four 5G, uh, base stations at the Indianapolis 500 and they took a car around the track with a 360 degree camera and they monitored the track Then they took the driver into the pits they blacked out all of his windows they put a VR headset on him and he used that 360 degree camera and he did 80 miles an hour around the Indianapolis 500 track if you don't have one millisecond of delay you're on a wall doing 90 miles an hour or 80 miles an hour on the Indianapolis track, right? 
So back to my comment in my opening statements, it's like, where does it go to? There's, the, it's, it's, it's completely up to your imagination. But think about some of the things that have been set up here tonight. How is AI, and how are things like security going to operate in 5G with one millisecond of delay, right? Every time we touch a data packet to inspect it, or to, to forward it, or accelerate it, or whatever, we're adding latency and delay into that packet, we're reducing the performance of that packet. So what are the new technologies that we're going to have to develop, and who are the companies that are going to develop how we're going to manage security, how we're going to manage you know, integrity in the network at 5G speeds and 5G latencies. It's, it's going to be an interesting dynamic. And honestly, I, I can't express enough that we have a complete blind spot to what 5G is going to bring to us. It's, it's stuff we're not even thinking about. And uh, it's, going to be, it's going to be really interesting to see what the, the next level of innovators and the next level of entrepreneurs come up with, with this type of resources stacked behind them. Covered it pretty well. Um, what I will add is that 5G with the with the latency that is so low and the data speeds those are going to be so high that itself opens up a lot of possibilities. It's it has to evolve. We have to see what kind of applications. But I'm I'm looking forward to more applications like I'll say WhatsApp, Instagram. What's next to them to connect people even more and uh, in a better manner. So, so I'd say we have to keep thinking about it. The, the 5G is kind of taking away all the values of what a tech can do. I'd like to invite questions from the audience, please. Can I shout? I shout? I can. You can use the other mics, the lavaliers. Hi, and this is Reza Sherkat from Wise IoT. Uh, from the IoT perspective, if we are talking about the new application for industrial uh, IoT or for anything that is not new uh, or not uh, same as the phone for providers, how the providers uh, like uh, service providers are going to um, facilitate the new companies, the startups coming, and they want to innovate in the like from the pitch from the point of view of it bringing the real low latency, mission critical, industrial IoT edge computing things into the picture, in, into the reality. How the providers help them to uh, from the mon monetizing and to be able to be successful. Okay, I, I know in Verizon we have several innovation centers, and we're 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 expanding the number of innovation centers that we have uh, for for exactly that reason uh, is to engage and encourage developers and innovation. Uh, I I think the real opportunities in 5G uh, as has been described. We're building a framework. Uh, the new uses and applications aren't going to come from operator boardrooms. Uh, they're going to come from the likes of, of how Facebook, Google started. Uh, it's, it's the innovators, the entrepreneurs, the ones who are, are not major companies starting out, necessarily. So I think one of the things that we've spent a lot of time talking about tonight with regards to 5G was around bandwidth and latency, which are super important parts of 5G. But there's the, the IoT piece of this is, is really interesting as well. We, we all know that cellular is a physics problem. I talk to people about that all the time. Right? Cellular signal is, is really hard to deal with sometimes, um, unless you're in really great environments with perfect conditions. So. Things like narrowband IoT. Today, if we have an underground parking structure and we want to know how many spaces are available four floors under the ground, and we're going to connect those parking spaces in a wireless network, 
we're going to have to build some type of Wi-Fi system or put cellular service in this underground structure just for that. The, the benefits of, of things like narrowband IoT, which is part of the 5G infrastructure, is that we can now get that signal down into the basement. We can be able to see and, and know and get the, the, the dynamics of what's going on with those vehicles, you know, whether it's turning left, whether it's turning right, which parking space it's in, uh, and we can get to, to places like that. So when we talk to the, the discussion about how are we gonna enable innovation, I think the way we, we do that is to do a great job of communicating and giving them that toolbox that was mentioned earlier. Uh, we, we are building the toolkit for them. We're building an SDK for entrepreneurs in 5G, right? We're, we're giving them the tools and telling them how you can utilize this technology. Now it's up to you to go find those innovative ideas and turn into business ideas to solve business problems or consumer problems and make it happen. So I think the way we enable them is to educate and then give them all the features and, and deploy all these technologies out into the, into the wild. Uh, this is a question for Facebook. Uh, have you ever thought in one of your applications, especially with 5G security, low latency, all the wonderful things and its ubiquity and being you know, available to all parts of the country, have you ever thought of making Facebook a voting machine? So we don't have these long lines. <laughs> and we don't have voter suppression. Good idea. I'll pass it on. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there are similar efforts of uh, using that platform for much more than connecting with friends. Uh, if you haven't heard of it, there is something called Marketplace on it. So you actually can do money transactions. You can buy things, sell things. So I would think this is the next step. Um, but of course, being cautious around it because it's about elections. But yeah. Get it ready before 2020. I, I have a question uh, for Jerry, although I think uh, others will, will want to respond. Jerry, you had a slide that uh, I couldn't quite see the, the health section that was down in the left corner. I uh, wondered what those applications or devices were. Um, well, you have some very early starts with the latest Apple Watch. Mike, please. When, 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 Mike. When, uh, I'm sorry. You, you have some early starts with the, you know, uh, the latest version of the Apple Watch, where where you have uh, the ability to detect if somebody has fallen uh, and, and to get emergency help. You have also, uh, I, I guess, an easy electrocardiogram capability. Those are just starting applications. If you think about the baby boomer generation and the likelihood of uh, trying to control the expense of medical care uh, and, and what will, will be the impact on, on, on the government for, for funding, uh, there, there's an opportunity within 5G uh, to use telemetry and, and a lot of remote medical monitoring that we, that we don't see today yet. Uh, but but I, I'm not quite sure with the ultra-reliable low latency that BK talked about that we want to do intercontinental remote surgery. But uh, I, I, I think that you know what we're seeing is we're engaging with verticals now and, and in the medical community they're the experts to know what what solutions they, they would like to see whether whether it's doing uh, analysis of, of, of blood samples in Africa to, to, to route that back to some uh, disease control centers elsewhere in the world in a very fast method but, but I think there's a lot of use cases and possibilities that are beyond my ability to imagine. Oh, okay. Yeah, the wearable space is really interesting uh, to me. There, there are there are devices out there that report to not only do EKGs and 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 
falls, but there's things that uh, say they can monitor blood pressure, they can even give you blood sugar without having to prick yourself. Uh, so there's, there's lots of devices coming down the road, and you can kind of ties back to my dental analogy earlier as well, right? It's kind of like the GEICO insurance plug-in to get you better rates on your car insurance for good behavior, better vitals, better, better uh, health habits could translate into that. Um, beyond the, the traditional medical device, right, we've always heard about remote surgery or, or remote uh, monitoring of health. There's also uh, another big space out there with regards to sensors that are going to going to be part of 5G. So uh, the biggest killer in hospitals today is staff. Uh, it's it, it's basically people not managing their their hygiene. They're not washing their hands properly. They're spreading disease and killing people in hospitals. And there are sensors being developed to to track the. Uh, the health of a hospital from a from a germ perspective. Uh, there's going to be all types of, of ways that they can monitor air quality and and, the, and all the different systems that go through a hospital to ensure that they're providing the best possible level of care. So there's there's so much going on in the medical industry uh, with regards to sensors. So I think 5G is is going to be a, a perfect enclave for, for those types of, of industries and opportunities to blast around. Thanks. Right. Uh, so my question was about uh, how does 5G and can be reconfiguration? Uh, but over time, uh, in fact, there have been lots of books in, in standards itself where we allow for a slow adaptation of the uh, uh, up and down in partitioning. And the rationale being that uh, traffic profiles change over time in a given area. And at any given point in time, it's not exactly homogeneous across a larger area. So you might have traffic hotspots in a specific location in the city, and at the same time, it's actually not quite loaded elsewhere. So the need to have uh, a more adaptive uh, TDD partitioning was felt even in 4G itself. And uh, for the first time in 5G, there's been some important, uh, uh, some of those uh, requirements were actually used as the uh, frame structures themselves were developed in this 5G standards process. So it allows for a fast turnaround times, everything being in a self-contained unit of transmission so that a packet is sent out and you get the acknowledgement or lack thereof immediately thereafter. So it, in principle, we now have enabled uh, adaptive slash dynamic CDD integrations. But that doesn't mean that we might start off from day one that way, but given the fact that it is a highly adaptive system, it's going to actually gradually go in that direction. And, uh, and that's therefore uh, an important aspect. Uh, I, I, also want to mention the fact that if you think about the way we uh, you know, take a look at traffic patterns today, uh, when we think of a downlink centric traffic, I mean that's more of a, that's how things are today. But over time as a, a connected cloud computing, for example, you tend to upload all your free information is really in the cloud and you're fetching the content, you're making some small edits in a PowerPoint presentation, you keep uploading it. This actually changes the way we use that, uh, use uh, the bandwidth itself. So the notion of a static configuration, a 3 to 1 configuration, or a, uh, or a 7 to 1 configuration, uh, those days will diminish. I mean, we might start off that way in 5G, but that's not how it's going to be. Uh, there, is, uh, there are enough hooks in the, in the specifications and in the technology to make sure that it's highly adaptive in nature. Uh, the second part of your question uh, was uh, related to uh, how do you actually make sure that when you have a device initiated session, uh, how do you actually handle that in 5G? Now one thing I mentioned earlier is that that's actually an active work in progress in 5G itself in release 16 specifications. It goes beyond release 16 into release 17 as well. But one thing that we want to do is make sure that the devices don't necessarily go through a full blown authentication every single time they wake up, send just a few bytes of data and then go back to sleep. It's actually absolutely uh, you know, ridiculous at some point to have such a huge overhead for a small transaction like that. It's an act of work. Uh, I'm going to hold my, uh, you know, obviously a lot of us have actual design proposals into it, but I'm going to wait till the specs are completed and then tell you exactly how things are. But the problem statement is well understood and there are several solutions that are being worked upon. Marty. Marty. Uh, Marty. Well, we've heard some uh, really uh, exciting uh, opportunities in the uh, 5G area, and mostly uh, technology. And I just wonder 
whether you have thought a lot about the fact that you know, there are uh, some big problems in society that are other than the Internet of Things. And one of our biggest problems is uh, uh, education. And how are we going to serve uh, 60 million people uh, with Internet who are children who can't afford $70 a month for a wireless broadband, and they are going to need wireless broadband. 20% uh, of our uh, GNP in the United States is going to healthcare and uh, the kind of things that you mentioned uh, may be helpful, uh, but that also is going to require uh, a uh, very low cost broadband. Uh, there are five or six percent of this country, that, uh, of the people in this country, that are unserved by any kind of uh, internet broadband uh, or uh, otherwise. There are enclaves in the big cities that are poor enough so they, they uh, carrier as much as they try don't have very good service in there. So I'm only asking about whether you have thought about the fact that as important as the Internet of Things uh, is, uh, are we really taking the Internet of People seriously? I, I think that's an excellent point, and as I mentioned when I spoke about 5G, I mentioned the opportunities to close the digital divide, as as well as what we were looking at, something called humanability, because the social impact and the social opportunity uh, can can either, if if you think about it, could be exacerbated if you were focused on seventy dollars a month or whatever the the price points were that would shut out a large segment of. of potential, not just in this country, but the 3.8 billion people that are not connected today. So the opportunity here, or, or, or the human social aspects here, of connecting more individuals, uh, that's not IMT, but the social benefits of connectivity, of, of having the ability to access the internet, access at a reasonable cost, all of the opportunities uh, to further education and to enable not not just young people but uh, more, more mature people to have access to, to medical care, to other information-based services uh, is something that's a very important part of what we're thinking about for 5G. Um, I, I have a question for the oh, sorry. Actually, I just want to get a couple of responses, yeah. so okay. give us a second. Uh, yeah, that's a, you know, it's one of the things that uh, uh, there are quite a few of us over here in the panel and probably a lot of others who have our own roles in the, in the, in the question that you're asking. So I'll try to answer from uh, how I foresee it from anyone who's in a semiconductor industry, for example. And one of the things that obviously as we're building 5G is really lowering the, the cost per bit delivered. And you can actually translate that in terms of uh, trying to make uh, access a little more affordable. And to how, what extent do we actually lower that? That's only one aspect of it. But there is something that uh, that actually we do talk a lot about when it comes to education. Uh, and, and that is, uh, it's a trend that's been happening for a while, but we do have uh, uh, a lot of, uh, not just what started off in distance education and then going into online courses that has actually become gradually far more effective. If uh, a person has broadband connectivity or some level of broadband connectivity, uh, uh, access to quality education happens to be that much easier. You're not confined to a specific kind of a, a, a human teacher who's doing that. And I do see a lot of promise in that. We do talk about it in the context of what we do with uh, uh, within Qualcomm and in our outreach uh, in general, but it's a concept that comes up over and over again. Uh, as to how do you make uh, education far more enriching, uh, especially in a lot of areas where it's not that easy to get quality teachers, and this might be one of the ways of doing it. All you need is broadband connectivity, and now it's a much better interactive and immersive experience. It's not just one watching a video, but you can actually have interaction in that. So technology has a role in that. We do, we do have a small role from Qualcomm's perspective, but it's a bigger perspective. We do talk to the government quite a bit on this aspect. It gets me again. All right. Um, so I think 
Your, your point is, is really well made, and I can personally attest that every one of the corporations that are represented up here have amazing philanthropic efforts going into how do we use technology for the good of society, and, and particularly education. That's low-hanging fruit, I think, for, for us in, in the carrier industry. Uh, because we, we do provide so much connectivity, right, where the, where the, the plumbing that we talked about earlier. And so we, we do a lot in the way of donations. We do a lot in the way of, of using technology to help educators understand how they can better reach those underserved, whether because of connectivity challenges or financial challenges or whatever they may be. But at the end of the day, I think your, your Internet of People uh, was a, a really great analogy, and I, I think one of the things that we as a society have to do to get together to make sure the whole village is is getting access to these great educational resources is that we got to continue to be more socially aware of how we can educate and help everybody in our community, um, not just through technology, but in everyday life and in every way we do things. Last question. I'll just add to that that what Bernie said is very fundamental to our mission of connectivity. We think that the people who are not connected, there is a reason behind it, and it is multifold. It's, it includes how the operators have to bear the costs of how they deploy networks, and attacking that in a collaborative way, and then seeing that the networks can be built simply and at a lower cost is going to solve a lot of that problem because there are areas where today it just doesn't make a, enough ROI for the operators to go and build the connectivity tools. So if we can solve those issues, that eventually gets to the health or the education and all of that coming to the people who deserve it. So Duga, you mentioned that uh, uh, manufacturing uh, one vertical where you look into the use cases and kind of get came back and then say we need to have X, you know, millisecond latency, so on and so forth. So what would be some, you know, two other uh, verticals you guys are actively, you know, looking into, talking to customers and coming back and then uh, trying to integrate those features. I'll also love to hear the same from T-Mobile Verizon uh, as well. So beyond uh, manufacturing, which uh, by the way is a pretty broad uh, uh, area in itself, and that's like a topic in itself, uh, but uh, beyond manufacturing, uh, uh, one of the industries which is now heavily uh, involved in, in 5G, and I'm actually quite I'm kind of really proud about that, is uh, the automotive industry. I mean, if you were to think about it like 10 years back or so, uh, we had uh, the automotive industry which was, uh, well, Let's just say that within the cellular ecosystem, uh, all of us kind of knew each other very well. There were the operators, the infrastructure vendors, the device manufacturers, and the chipset vendors. Close-knit community, all of us knew each other very well. And as we were getting into 5G, one of the most important things was to be far more inclusive and have everyone be a part of it. The automotive industry has started attending and have, have, they have started embracing cellular technology quite a bit in the last few years. Uh, one of the statistics that I read recently, and I have to actually look it up, is something more than 25% of the vehicles that are sold today come in with inbuilt connectivity. And that's quite something actually. It's not, it wasn't there like uh, 10 years back. And today, as we are looking at uh, uh, the automotive industry is going ahead with a certain uh, view on how they want to do autonomous driving, one natural question that comes to mind is, is autonomous driving going to be only about cameras and sensors? or do radios have a role uh, in that whole equation? There's always a network effect that comes into the picture over there. Everyone must have that capability, then and only then you can actually start using radios, whereas using cameras and sensors, you don't necessarily rely upon that. But increasingly it is becoming clear that, yes, there is a role for radio, it goes a lot beyond what we currently think of in terms of basic network connectivity, and this is where vehicles that can connect to all the infrastructure around them. Uh, this includes traffic lights and stop signs. It leads to all sorts of uh, you know, fuel efficiency uh, uh, improvements, uh, far more uh, uh, you know, information that can be actually conveyed in a more real-time manner as opposed to relying upon something that can have uh, much more latency. You can actually get a sense of uh, 
both the speed limits and stop signs varying over time in a certain way. Not to mention the fact that when you finally get down to your autonomous driving, there's a lot of path planning that occurs on a millisecond basis. You're trying to figure out what should be my next move. But your next move is based upon what everyone else is doing. You end up predicting that today from looking at all the other vehicles, in effect looking at the camera and sensor information. But in some instances, if these vehicles can communicate that information to you, you can make it far more efficient. So the automotive industry is one more example. From Qualcomm, we spend a lot of time with that industry. Uh, that's just one more example that I want to point out. So two came to mind uh, that, that actually tie in the third day as well. Uh, first for me is transportation. So we have a lot of stuff we move around in this country, and we need a lot of, of observation and, and paying attention to what's going on with the way we move things around this country. So uh, sensors are going to play a huge part in, in changing the way uh, things like food is, is handled and, and packages are handled. I mean, think about Amazon delivering packages with drones, uh, you know, planes, trains, automobiles, all the different ways we move things around. And uh, going back to that is how do we manage that? How do we maintain that? How do we ensure integrity and, and leverage the efficiencies of 5G to do that better? The second side of that for me is, is first responders and EMS. So uh, very interesting things going on with first responders and, and 5G is going to be very key to that. So you know, imagine a world, you know, maybe we're in, in uh, downtown Los Angeles and uh, a fire goes up in a, in a, in a high rise and uh, four engine companies need to get to that high rise. In, in this world, they're, they're going to be able to manage traffic lights and, and set up those four engine companies to have green lights and their whole path, you know, and block all the rest of the traffic. Uh, they're going to be able to intelligently direct the driver of that vehicle where it's going. And then, of course, um, the ability to even engage the EMS system more deeply and quicker so we can deliver better medical care and response and help to those people that are affected by these emergency services. So there's, uh, there's so much uh, going on in those two fields that uh, I think they're going to be uh, big leveragers of this technology and, and taking things to the next level and delivering uh, a, a higher level of service, which equates to a better quality of life for all of us. So I think with all these advances in communication technology, uh, we're still using displays and phones that you hold here are, you know, the type type keyboard that was invented many years ago. So it feels like the friction is the connection to the human being. You know, the very high. Uh, so the question is, are you seeing any innovation in how um, we interact with the uh, internet? Maybe it's a Facebook <coughs> question because you guys are closest to that. And are there any new, uh, for example, I still need to go meet people because touching flash is the only way to get deals done. Uh, there is nothing, I mean, teleconferencing helps you a little bit, but not advanced enough. So how does this last mile friction to the human being get solved? I would say a lot of it has to do with the VR part of it. And the more we innovate in that space, it's going to help to get uh, over. So uh, I think it's a, it's only the brain reading and the smell that is not transported today, but everything else is kind of getting there. Yeah, yeah, so uh, all this. Yeah, so that, that's, the, that's the space where we can uh, get to connecting devices to people more and more. And, more of that um, VR tech translates into the apps and everything. It's going to help like, drive it further. I think we have the startings of the tea leaves to read on, on this. Um, I, I don't know if you guys saw the recent article that, that came out earlier this year about MIT, but they actually have developed a headset that can read your mind, take your thoughts, nothing uttered out of your mouth and type it out onto uh, an interface. Um, if you think about the way, yeah, yeah we, don't want to, we don't want to read all of these. Um, 
and, and look at the way technology has helped um, some of our of our deaf community, right? How they've been able to program into the brain and, and be able to get hearing to previously deaf people. Um, so I think the if you think about those types of technologies, um, Qualcomm probably doesn't want to hear this, but you know there's there's going to be a day. It's it's inevitable that we're not going to be carrying a smartphone. I don't know when that is. Um, we're still waiting for the Jetsons, you know, hovering cars. So, you know, it's it's somewhere down the road. But that interface, you're right, touch is going to be a big part of it. The senses are going to be a big part of it. And the, the way we interact with data and the way we interface with these intelligent networks is, is going to change dramatically. Um, and I think the 5G um, is that baseline platform that is probably going to I have uh, one final question I was told to ask, but I'm going to split my final question with my friends uh, here. So, a uh, quick answer from each of you, if you don't mind. What's the next business model that's going to break or change, like Uber changed the business model in the industry with the advent of 5G? You guys all used very hyperbole phrases when you describe, we don't know what's coming next, but it's big, it's going to be fantastic. What is it? What's the next one you see? Each one of you can make the prediction, that it'd be great. Thank you. <laughs> Just a small question. <laughs> uh, I, I think we're going to see the end of cable TV programming as we've known it. Jerry closer. We no longer will have a schedule of what shows are on what day of the week or what time. Uh, and, and we will have much more choice rather than uh, limitations of, of just that one set of channels. <laughs> yeah. and, and this will be delivered uh, whether, whether you're at home or you're mobile. Uh, and it's going to be at your decision point. And, and I was thinking as the earlier question was going on, the expectations by age, uh, I, I was fascinated with my, uh, my grandson. I had a big problem because he was always getting yelled at for touching the TV. But the problem was he was used to his iPad, and the TV wasn't behaving like his iPad. So, so the expectations that we're seeing in, in, in young people as they mature, they're going to be very different than groups who were satisfied with talking or interacting with a computer or interacting with a wired phone and things like that. So there's a demographic aspect to this, but, but clearly TV as we know it is, is not going to be around very much longer. Yeah, so here I'm going to talk about not so much about the user experience per se, but what happens at the back end. Um, we see that the business model is changing at the base of how the network components are being built. And to that extent, uh, we think that it's going to come towards open, more openness on how the software and hardware is being built. And let me clarify that by open, we don't mean free, we mean open where as much as it can be shared, the architectures, the APIs, the contents will be shared, and then there will be room to kind of innovate on top of it and to build everything better, faster together. So I think that's the business model change that we are looking forward to. So you're asking us to predict the future. And in there, it's going to be wrong, but there is, there is a certain trend that I did want to mention, and that is, uh, the digitalization of manufacturing and bringing in some sort of an enterprise mentality into, into manufacturing uh, plants. Uh, this is something that's already started. It's not something that's new. I mean, there was already wireline quite a bit. But as we get into wireless, it is an interesting trend because one of the things that actually does enable at that point is, um, this is this gets a lot more into economics in terms of uh, the cost of manufacturing is dictated predominantly by the cost of labor. But at some point in time, one can actually start thinking in terms of it comes down to a cost of electricity and where 
you, the more automation you have, it actually tries to normalize things. So it's an easy prediction to make in some sense, but it's not that obvious that there is that level of digitization that's happening in manufacturing these days. It's something that actually one can think about a little bit further. So, so two came to mind for me, um, and I don't think either of them are right, but I'm going to throw them out there. Um, one of them is I really feel like the grocery industry is going to die someday. Um, the, the ability, I mean, we're, we're seeing it with things like Uber Eats and other things with the ability to deliver food, but I even go a little deeper than that. If you look at what happened with cryptocurrency and blockchain and the way we have the ability to track food, from the source, like it, it left an organic farm, it went to this manufacturing facility. I mean, people care so much about the quality of their food and, and where they're getting it from, that the idea that we have to drive to a grocery store, which by the way, I, I think the stat, I'm pretty sure, is 23% of the miles you put on your car goes from your house to the grocery store. Think about that, almost a quarter of your vehicle miles is from the grocery store and back. I think that that is going to go away to some extent. You know, everybody will, you know, still want to go to a farmer's market and go buy from the source or do unique things like that. But your everyday grocery runs will probably come to your house, and they'll probably come from a lot of different sources um, because you'll want that quality and that particular thing from that source. So that's number one. Um, and probably the most controversial thing I'm going to bring up is um, I don't think we're I don't think it's going to be long before we're not talking about cellular companies and cable companies and telephone companies. Um, everything we do today can pretty much be done on all those channels I just mentioned, and I, I mean channels meaning modes of, of service, can be done across the internet today. So eventually it's all going to be about the internet. So how are you going to consume your internet, and where is it going to be from? Um, we, we compartmentalize that today into industries, the cable industry, the telephone industry, the wireless industry. Um, I don't think, I think someday it's, we're not going to have all those differentiations. We're going to buy internet service, and we're going to buy it from somebody. And how we interface with that to your comment earlier will be interesting to see. And how we pay for that will be interesting to see as well. Right? We, have a, we have a very... Um, evolved pricing structure in the way we, we do internet today, right? Depending on what technology you looked at and, and where you grew up in, <laughs> quite frankly, right? What industries you grew up in. Um, and so um, I think all those models are going to be broken. I think it's going to, I think there's going to be just, you're going to get access to the internet and you're going to get it from the person or the, or the company that, that delivers it the way you want to receive it. Thank you. With that, I would like to wrap up. I think this was an excellent panel. We covered technology, use cases, devices, how we connect billions of people. This was a great panel. Thank you so much. Each of your slides to the audience would like to. Would that be okay? Sure. How many of you would like a copy of these slides? Okay, excellent. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. He didn't say he's come on the website or email. Um, he didn't say, but uh, we'll, we'll try to put it. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.